Rory, there is an, 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 uh, um, the commercial world is a world of material values. Um, not no. exclusively. No? No. You would be a very, very bad manager if you attempted to run people entirely using numerical metrics and incentives. I mean, the, the, the more astute business people are actually uh, not quite as uh, portrayed. I think that's fair to no, say. Because is, what, what I'm heading at is, what, what I, or what I wonder about is, uh, 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 also related to, 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 to remarks of, of, of Roger, what happened to our values? You know, why is it that we started to believe that uh, 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 many things you know, commercial world wants us to believe in uh, are indeed you know, the most important things there are? Um, you can answer that in numerous different ways. I mean, first of all, what is innate in human beings? And to some degree, like it or not, some degree of status seeking in some form seems to be innate for the simple reason that status is a scarce good, uh, by definition, in fact. You can't have a world in which everybody enjoys high status across the board, nor, necess you know, nor necessarily would you want to live in such a place. Um, but um, uh, what you're suggesting here, I suppose, is that you know, people are being manipulated and uh, as a result feel a sense of disquiet. Um, I think, first of all, we're always looking at external agency as the reason for people being unhappy. First of all, people are innately a little bit unhappy, and, or indeed dissatisfied might be a better word. And it's rather good that they are, uh, to be frank. Uh, that's the first point. You know, the lot of man is not actually one of uh, unending bliss and the eradication of all possible annoyance or irritation. Um, the second point is we always blame things on external agency, but quite a lot of what is probably causing disquiet in society is actually the product of things people have freely chosen to do themselves. Um, atheism might actually be a very good explanation for one of them, by the way. Um, urbanization, you know, patently, uh, you know, a society which was mostly rural and lived in communities of 150 to 300 will suffer a certain amount of dislocation being rapidly exposed to huge numbers of other people with no sense of identity or indeed you know, not even paternity. And there's actually a great correlation between that. Why did Neiman Marcus, the luxury goods store, start in Dallas and Houston, not in Boston? Oil money. People arrive very rapidly, unsure of their status, paranoid about their status. Suddenly, luxury goods sales go up. Uh, shortage of females, incidentally, also leads to higher luxury goods purchases on the part of men. Um, so, um, but putting large numbers of people, particularly also the extent to which classes of people now cluster together so closely, so you're in very, very close competition. The banker who actually, you know, the banker who once would have thought himself as immensely rich lives next door to someone he envies. So all those factors like, you know, urbanization and, uh, and the change in sort of demography and, and uh, human migration, which happens, it's a complex system, it happens on the basis of individual choice. And some of the consequences of those choices are going to be slightly unfortunate. But, 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 but it, well, no, Roger, please. I want to say something. The word modernity was not uttered, this word modernity. We live in a modern society, modern societies. And modernity, since it came about, first in Europe, then by now in the whole world, has something standing features. What its characteristic on modernity? First and foremost, it is distribution through the market. Redistribution, if there is, through the state. And that's a combination of capitalism and socialism, yes. if yeah. I may say so. Second, it's a dissatisfied society. Because the first slogan of modernity was every person, every man, woman, are born free. Never before have they uttered this sentence. It was an absurd sentence. One was born a master, the other was born a slave. The moment we said all men are more free, we created a dissatisfied society because we are not free enough, because some are more free than us. Uh, we are not equally free. So everyone is dissatisfied. Nothing wrong with dissatisfaction. This is what I want to say, because dissatisfaction keeps our society alive and kicking. In previous societies, in traditional societies, if you're entirely dissatisfied, came the crisis. Of course, crisis, I agree with you, it's a metaphor, okay? But according to this metaphor, the sick person either dies or recovers. Normally, traditional societies die in crisis. Modern society, for the time being, recovers always from this crisis. Crisis belong 
to the life of modern society. Without crisis, you cannot survive. Without newspapers, you cannot exist. Without propaganda, you cannot exist. Because we need to remain dissatisfied. You need to be able to say, what exists is wrong. Something else would be good. What exists is ugly. Something else would be beautiful. What is, exists that's the most important is unjust. Something else would be just. We live from this. Sometimes we are right, something we are wrong. When we make the propositions about this something else, when we have make the wrong proposition, disaster can follow, as we know in from the 20th century. But it's our responsibility, not. Yes. Well, Anish Heller has just given a wonderful demonstration of what it is to be alive and kicking. <laughs> I, I felt. I felt the table vibrating under the effect of it. But I, I actually wanted to say something else in response to what Rory said, which I think is very important. He referred to the transfer of populations from small villages to great megalopolis, uh, and um, how this causes enormous disruption and produces in itself a, a search for status of a new kind. But I think I would just like to reflect on the fact that the, the great cities that have grown in the modern world have also brought along with themselves an art and a literature of loneliness. You know, a, a loneliness of a new kind, which you find in, uh, already in Balzac, but also in Flaubert, uh, and uh, of course, paradigmatically, in people like uh, Kafka and so on, in the Central European tradition. Uh, uh, and it's as though our need for each other uh, which is the thing that is most beautiful in human beings, is suddenly cut off from its, from its fulfillment at the very moment when it, when it can be so easily fulfilled by in so many ways. And I think this is a most interesting uh, uh, thing to reflect upon. Uh, you know, that, this is the major transition that, that, we have, that, that, that modernity has imposed upon us. Uh, th this mass society where there, we're surrounded at every point by opportunities, by people, by uh, opportunities of friendship and, uh, and also opposition and so on. And at the same time, there has grown within that this uh, unassuageable core, core of loneliness. That very, very interesting thing. A beautiful point. When I moved to London, I grew up on the Welsh borders, I gained enormously in terms of financial capital, but in social capital I became rapidly impoverished. I have friends in London who I've known since the age of seven, probably about ten of them. There's nobody I can really call on now to pick me up from the airport this evening, with the possible exception of my wife. Okay. So in terms of you know, the favour economy, all those economies die out and are replaced by the commercialisation of everything. Another very interesting correlation is, if you look at American voting patterns, um, far bigger than race, sexual orientation, or anything else, is simply where you live. If you live in a, in a town or city over 600,000, you're overwhelmingly Democrat. If you don't, you're overwhelmingly Republican. Now, what you derive from that, you could say that arguably rural communities actually find that, you know, what you might call free market capitalism actually works fairly well and is fairly amiable part of their lives, and they're content with it, that everybody in larger cities feels that something desperately needs to change. But to what they're attributing their dissatisfaction may be entirely the wrong thing. Daniel, to start for all of you, but why is it that we embraced in the 80s, 90s, uh, uh, this model of neoliberalism. Why is it that, that, that it could become such a powerful ideology that for at least two decades we wanted to believe that the financial world and everything related to that you know, would be our future and, and well, why? I guess it comes out of a sense of collapse of a, a, a previous you know, seemingly viable models, the sense of the collapse of uh, post-war social democracy, or at least the crisis of post-war, if we're allowed to use the word crisis, uh, social democracy, the, obviously the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the sort of division of the world into two systems, and a kind of triumphant discourse of ne neoliberalism that, that you know, was, was sold to us and that appealed to something perhaps in many people uh, linked with this idea of endless progress and growth linked in the way Rory was describing with perhaps certain illusions about infinite possibility. Of course, only for a minority of people in the world, but nonetheless a powerful, had a powerful kind of grip on us. But I want to come back. I mean, there, there, of course, there was that f feeling of, of a model triumphant. But if we're thinking about modernity, which Agnes is inviting us 
to do, I think one should hold on to another side of modernity in this discussion, which is, I'm thinking of Zygmunt Bauman's book, Modernity and the Holocaust, that in a way the question then of what it was in modernity that doesn't produce this kind of more creative flux and change and emancipation, but certain kinds of risk uh, and the, the pull towards the drive towards the, the world of camps and extermination or the world of a police state and so on, which has to be also the, the sort of other side of any conversation about modernity, presumably, of the emancipatory possibilities and that much darker side and how one understands those relationships because they're clearly very modern forms of barbarism. They're not simply some archaic remnant. There's something that modernity produced that, that is extremely ominous. And that, that's, I, I, as a hist historian, I guess I'm interested in the history of the endeavor to understand those processes and what they owe to social factors, politics, but also to perhaps to certain things about people, to the nature of mind, um, the unconscious and so on, that the, the Frankfurt School thought about, many people thought about in the 20th century. And I, the book that came to my mind was Eric Fromm's great book, which I still think people, you know, it, it repays rereading, Fear of Freedom, uh, which was also translated as Escape from Freedom in 1941, which was an attempt to think about in a way, you know, this kind of put the, the, the fear people have of that freedom and in a way the lure towards authoritarianism. And that's also part of the story of modernity. I think it's very important thing that you said and what you said. It's basically impossible to compare gains and losses. That's our problem. You spoke about, uh, about loneliness. That's very true. But loneliness is a loss but solitude is again. So you cannot, uh, this is what you cannot compare basically. I would not say to me that it's wonderful, it's a progressive epoch, not at all. I said it's different from all the previous epochs, different characteristics, and there are gains and there are losses. I think basically communities are lost in modernity. That's a loss, but solitude is one which is important for us single individuals. We can be alone. That's it.